Imagine a time when things get so bad, it feels like the world is ending. That's what the Bible's book of Revelation talks about when it mentions the apocalypse. It's like a big, final chapter that God has shared with us, so we know what to expect at the very end, whether it's the end of our own lives or the end of the world as we know it. The main message for us is pretty simple. Keep doing God's work. But there's a lot about the apocalypse that many of us might not know or understand very well. That's why we're here today. We want to clear things up and share with you 10 important things every Christian should know about the apocalypse. Number one, God's clock has been ticking. Almost 2,000 years in the year 95 AD, God highlighted the greatness of Christ. Jesus then asked Apostle John to write down his last messages for the church, addressing its past, present, and future. God promises a special blessing for those who read, hear, and follow his words, saying, for the time is near. The last days or end time started when Jesus Christ was born. In Revelation, Jesus is seen walking among lampstands, telling John what he likes and dislikes about seven churches. This final book completes the word of God. Smyrna and Philadelphia, among these churches, didn't receive any criticisms. The people in Smyrna were going through tough times, but Jesus told them to stay faithful, and in return, he'd give them the crown of life. In Philadelphia, believers stayed true to Christ's name and persevered in following his words. Jesus assured them that they wouldn't face a challenging time. Those who succeeded, he promised, would be like strong pillars in God's temple in the New Jerusalem. Number two, the Holy Spirit raptures. After Jesus rose from the dead, he spoke with his disciples for 40 days. Then a cloud took him up into the heavens. Two men in white clothes said he would come back the same way they saw him go. This event is known as Jesus being raptured. Paul also talks about being taken to the third heaven and hearing words he can't describe. This is considered Paul being raptured. In Revelation 4, 2, John hears a voice from heaven saying, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after these things. So, John experienced a rapture too. That's three instances. Before the day of the Lord comes, the Holy Spirit who holds back will be taken away. Currently, God's Spirit resides in the soul of every believer, serving as a guarantee of our inheritance. When the Holy Spirit is taken out, every believer, the church, the body of Christ, goes up with this part of God dwelling within. Then, we will always be with the Lord. About three and a half years later, according to Revelation 11, two witnesses and 144,000 young Jewish men will testify for 1,260 days and then be killed. But surprisingly, God will bring them back to life in Jerusalem. They'll stand up and a loud voice from heaven will say, Come up here. These two witnesses will also be taken up, kind of like being raptured. Number three, some churches will turn away. The apocalypse will see a lot of church turning away from the right way. The Ephesus church did a lot of good things, but they forgot their primary love for Jesus. Jesus should be our first and only love. Without his vibrant love in us, it's like closing the doors and going home. We're just pretending to be a church. When people come to your church, do they see the love and power of the Holy Spirit in action among the members? The believers in Ephesus were told to change their ways or their lampstand would be taken away. This warning is relevant for churches today too. The Pergamum church let false beliefs take hold. Jesus said they were in a place like Satan's throne. They put up with the wrong teachings of Balaam and confused those who sought truth from them. Jesus warned them to change their ways, or he'd fight against them with the power of his words. False teachings and lazy church members might still test our Lord's patience. Both these churches were given a chance to turn around. Christ's door of forgiveness and mercy is still open. As the apocalypse draws nearer, more churches will turn away from God's love. Number four, some churches will tolerate idolatry and immorality. 
The church in Thyatira could be like any church in the USA. They put up with a woman named Jezebel. She claimed to be a prophetess but led God's followers into doing wrong things like immoral acts and eating stuff offered to idols. You might be thinking, we don't offer things to idols. What about your kids? Are they into things like immorality and not believing in God? Maybe because of Hollywood, sports, or other stuff you think is more important than teaching them about God. Western Christian parents often prioritize idolizing their children over being faithful to God and serving His people. While having kids is good, it's easy for them to unintentionally become like gods. The importance of Tommy's swimming, Zadie's skating, and Rochelle's tutoring may overshadow going to church or reading the Bible together as a family. Even though the Word of God and the people of God are crucial, the greatest commitment often lies with the children. The pursuit of the perfect family image takes precedence, and God fits in around that when priorities clash. Additionally, the average American Christian tends to idolize politics. We pray and speak as if the kingdom's fate depends on our preferred political figure or party winning. In essence, we treat our chosen president or political party as if they were gods. Jesus said the Sardis church, which was very lenient, was spiritually dead. He yelled, wake up, and urged them to notice what was left. Even though they were lacking, Jesus offered them a chance to change. He promised those who stayed pure would walk with him in white clothes because they deserve it. This happenings in Revelation gave us a glimpse that during the apocalypse, more churches will tolerate idolatry and immorality. Number five. What Daniel tells us about the apocalypse. Israel's rabbis claim that Daniel's book is about dreams and there is nothing much to learn from it. Daniel, as a teen captive in Babylon, lived faithfully and God blessed him. If the Jewish rabbis had understood Daniel's prophecies, they would have known about their return from captivity when and where Jesus would be born, and the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. The angel Gabriel showed up to Daniel, sharing about 70 decreed weeks and the desolation of his people. Daniel, guided by the angel, learned about future kings, the abomination of desolation, and when it would happen. Gabriel also introduced Daniel to the powerful prince, Michael, who protects Israel, but he assured at that time, your people, everyone listed in the book, will be saved. Daniel was informed about this tough three and a half years. God then sealed up Daniel's words until the end of time, but now we comprehend what Daniel was saying. Number six, there will be signs that will signal the apocalypse. Before going to the cross, Jesus instructed us to look for specific signs indicating the start of the apocalypse is near. There will be false messiahs, wars, rumors of war, famines, and earthquakes. This challenging period is already happening. The bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945 had a big impact on the signs of the end times. Right after the news, they turned to their Bibles, especially the book of 2 Peter, which talks about the earth being destroyed by fire and melting with fervent heat. There was a connection, thinking that nuclear destruction could fulfill the Bible's prophecy about the earth's destruction. During the nuclear arms race, images of atomic destruction and global thermonuclear war were often linked to Bible prophecies as the scientific way this foretold destruction might happen. He mentioned that believers will face tough times and even be killed. Christians will be disliked by people from all nations because of his name. Nowadays, we see more worldwide torture and brutal murders of people due to their faith in Jesus than ever before. False prophets are thriving and lawlessness is on the rise. Love for others is diminishing. We can all testify to the warning signs exploding around us. The message about God's kingdom will be spread throughout the entire world, and then the end will come. Number seven, an enemy will come to destroy. John saw Jesus standing among the lampstands and was instructed, write down what you have seen, what is happening now, 
and what will take place later. In a spiritual experience, John was taken back and forth between heaven and earth to witness these things. John reveals the living God seated on his throne, encircled by elders and four living creatures. The Lamb, also known as the Lion from the tribe of Judah, receives the scroll with seals. A heavenly choir sings, and Jesus opens the first seal. A rider on a white horse, holding a bow and a crown, sets out to conquer. Daniel talks about a powerful prince who will emerge, someone bold and skilled in deceit, mighty enough to harm the holy people. Could this bold prince in Daniel be the rider on the white horse, the Antichrist? If you believe, don't worry. God will send Jesus to save us from his big anger at the right time. But we should be good workers who won't be ashamed when he comes. God didn't choose us to be angry with us, but to save us through Jesus, who died for us. So, whether we're awake or asleep, we'll live with him. Number 8. There will be two witnesses. In the book of Revelation, God mentions that he will empower two witnesses to prophesy for 1,260 days while dressed in sackcloth. These two individuals have sparked much speculation about their identity in their three-and-a-half-year ministry. The passage in Revelation links these witnesses to Zechariah's vision of two olive trees and two lampstands. This connection emphasizes the role of God's Holy Spirit in accomplishing His work, a concept previously conveyed to the prophet Zechariah. The olive trees symbolize God's Spirit, reinforcing the idea that the witnesses will carry out their mission through the power of the Holy Spirit, similar to God's work during the time of Zerubbabel. Throughout the Bible, pairs of individuals often collaborate in God's work, demonstrating increased productivity and support. This principle is reflected in the choice of two witnesses, highlighting the importance of cooperation. Additionally, the use of two witnesses aligns with God's judicial principles, emphasizing the significance of multiple testimonies to establish a matter. Thus, the presence of two witnesses serves as a warning urging people to repent before facing consequences for disobedience. Number 9. There will be an unholy trinity. John and Daniel share stories about a powerful leader coming to the world. This person claims to create a peaceful global system for religion, government, and money. However, he's a fake, controlled by Satan. We'll call him Beast. He is a man possessed by Satan. Daniel mentions a peace agreement this leader will make with Israel, letting them rebuild their temple and restart Jewish sacrifices. To prove the man's strength, he gets a serious head injury, stays dead for three days, and then, with devil's help, he comes back to life. After that, everyone in the world starts worshiping him as if he's a god. This guy, the Antichrist, is Satan's son, and God allowed him to rule for 42 months. He brings along another character, Beast Hash 2, who acts like his worship leader, making everyone adore the Antichrist. Each of these beasts have seven heads and ten horns. The dragon also has seven heads and ten horns, suggesting that these three creatures are from the same family. This matches with the animals in Daniel 7, which also have a total of seven heads and ten horns. In their fight against God, the beast and the false prophet team up with the dragon. They go after the saints and those who refuse to worship the image of the beast, influencing Earth's kings with three unclean spirits for the battle of Armageddon. Eventually, Christ defeats the two beasts, and they end up in the fiery lake. Number 10. The enemy will be defeated and Christ will reign in Revelations. The sky opens up revealing a majestic white horse. Seated on it is someone known as Faithful and True, ready to judge and wage a war of righteousness. Joining him are armies dressed in gleaming white linen. Yes, that's us. We're all mounted on white horses, following King Jesus into whatever lies ahead. And from his mouth, there's a sharp sword, 
ready to strike the nations. He's going to rule them with an iron rod. The beast, the kings of the earth, and their armies are gearing up for a fight. Suddenly, angels from the Lord God Almighty step in, seizing the beast and the false prophet and tossing them alive into the fiery lake. The remaining armies meet their end by King Jesus' sword. Another angel descends with a key to the abyss and a big chain. He grabs and ties up Satan, throwing him into the abyss until a thousand years pass. Then the souls of those who had been beheaded because of the testimony of Jesus, those who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received the mark, they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Okay, dear people, we've come to the end of this video. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to like this video and hit the subscribe button so you can get notified when other great videos like this are released.